Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Brett Shadle. I'm the chair of the Department of History here at Virginia Tech. And we're very happy to have all of you with us here through the Zoom and through Facebook. Um, this is the most recent in a series of webinars that the History Department has been hosting since last summer, linking historical and contemporary issues around race and social justice. Um, today, we're very excited to have scholars talking about spatial and racial inequalities. As part of that, I do want to take a moment for the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the Tutelo Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tutelo Monacan nations and to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I hope you also take a moment wherever you are to consider the original owners of the land on which you stand. Um, I'd also like to point out, if you look in the chat, the first post is a link to our previous webinars and other events that the Department of History has um, hosted. And I'll post those in Facebook in a moment too. We also have two upcoming events. Uh, one is actually this afternoon by Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz talking about the white nationalist basis of the Second Amendment. That's at uh, today at 2.30. Um, and the link is there. And we also have another, our final webinar of the year coming up uh, later in uh, the semester on April 15th at noon, Protect Your Spirit, Native Resistance and to Settler Violence. And the link to that is also in the chat. Um, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A function here. If you're watching on Facebook, you can post your questions there and I will pass those along to the moderator. And the moderator is Dr. Paul Quigley and I'll turn it over to him. If you have any questions, there is a Q&A function here. If you're watching on Facebook, you can post your questions there and I will pass those along to the moderator. And the moderator is Dr. Paul Quigley and I'll turn it over to him. Thank you so much. I'd like to add my words of welcome. Uh, we're really glad to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, my role today is fairly straightforward. I'm going to introduce the speakers and then at the end I'll moderate the questions and discussion that we have after the talks. Thank you so much. I'd like to add my words of welcome. Uh, we're really glad to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, my role today is fairly straightforward. I'm going to introduce the speakers and then at the end I'll moderate the questions and discussion that we have after the talks. And today I encourage you all to submit your questions at any time through the Q&A box on Zoom. And at the end, we'll get to as many as we can. And of course, one of the great things about Zoom versus in-person events is that asking questions is very easy in Zoom. You just type them into the Q&A box anytime. You don't, you know, don't have to worry about interrupting the speaker, um, which is really good because one of the worst things about Zoom is from the speaker's point of view is not knowing exactly what the audience is thinking. Um, so it's great when we receive, whether it's a comment, a question, an observation about one of the talks or the panel as a whole, we really appreciate your input. So keep those coming. Again, you can start now and continue after the talks as well. Um, and I'll introduce each speaker one at a time just before they speak. We've got four speakers. They're each going to take about 10 minutes or so. And our first speaker is Dr. Lawrence T. Brown. He's the founder and director of the Black Butterfly Project. That's a racial equity education and consulting firm. He's held positions previously at Morgan State University, where he led the Be More Lead Free initiative. And he also directed the US COVID-19 Atlas work for the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program in partnership with the University of Chicago Center for Spatial Data Science. So thanks so much for being with us. Welcome, Dr. Brown. All right, thank you, Paul. And good morning to everyone on the, well, actually it should be afternoon for everybody now. Um, unless you're joining us from somewhere else in the world. Um, so thank you to the Virginia Tech Department of History for the invitation. They gave us 10 minutes, so I'm going to jump right into my presentation, which is um, the enduring legacy of Baltimore apartheid. And I wanna show you how I use history to sort of really shape or contribute to the shaping of a narrative here in Baltimore 
So I start out with these three mayors who helped establish what I call Baltimore apartheid in the city of Baltimore in the state of Maryland. And you have these three mayors here that all played a pivotal role. Um, and so you have John Barry Mahul, the first mayor, he passed the first residential racial zoning law in 1910. And then immediately thereafter, you had Mayor James Preston come into office. He was uh, a strong, staunch advocate for uh, multiple forms of segregation, but these middle two happened when he was in office, racially restrictive covenants. He visited Chicago to learn about how they were segregating what were then called uh, Negroes or colored people in their city. And then uh, Mayor Howard Jackson was mayor during the imposition of segregated public housing. So this New York Times article right here was published Christmas Day, 1910. And you can see that headline that really sort of highlights Baltimore's prominence in establishing a regime of racial segregation. Baltimore tries drastic plan of race segregation, strange situation which led the Oriole City to adopt the most pronounced Jim Crow measure on record. And you see the man in the middle, John Barry Mahul, the mayor. Um, and then the city council member, Samuel West, he introduced the ordinance. You had the great grand nephew of the poet. Now, this is not the poet, Edgar Allan Poe, but his grand nephew, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the city solicitor. And this black man here, George McMeckin, who uh, moved into an all white block, did what black people do, said, yes, we can. But the white community said, oh, no, you can't. And so they passed this law on December 19th, 1910. And it's, uh, this article comes from the New York Times Magazine. You can pull it up um, off the internet. Very fascinating piece. Then I also looked at uh, other newspaper accounts in the er era. You begin to see in the early 19-teens, uh, this language in newspapers like the Baltimore Sun, race law and council aims to end Negro invasion to prevent Negro invasion, Negro invasion halted, plan to check Negro invasion is inaugurated. So you got Negroes are moving into the neighborhood and you have the propaganda being pushed by newspapers, the main media of the time to help block home buying while black. You see the hospitals, they favored the plan. You got uh, neighborhood associations, the Lafayette Square Protective Associations. They are involved and at this time, Baltimore is a majority white city. So these are white institutions playing a role in helping to block black people. And then you even have churches, the church. Oh my goodness. The churches were involved in helping the black home buying while black. And then uh, even my field gets in on the action right here. We have uh, a suburban colony proposed. Uh, this was under Mayor James Preston's tenure. And you have the acting commissioner of health from the Baltimore City Health Department. And you can see over here, they use these statistics to really sort of say health disparities, if you will, to say that black people were more likely to die from a various amounts of diseases, tuberculosis, pneumonia, syphilis, influenza, polio, mylitis, the whooping cough, all these is that black people are more likely to die. We got to segregate them and affect quarantine black people so that they don't get us sick as white people and so my field is also implicated public health plays a role then you have this mount royal improvement association letter from 1929 or 30. Uh, again there's the church association congregational church they are hosting this pro segregation meeting uh, and they're bragging that they made the district safe for white occupancy by the execution of a sufficient number of the association's protective agreement agreements and those are those res racially restrictive covenants that I talked about earlier. Then I found this letter in the Baltimore City archives where again the church oh my goodness the church they lobbied the mayor for racial segregation. Look at what they're talking about. They said, whereas the said invasion by the Negro race, if allowed to continue on said Madison Avenue will unquestionably, within a short period of time, destroy both the financial value of said church properties and the religious usefulness 
of said churches in said communities and you had five churches on this letter you got the presbyterian church you got the episcopal church the lutherans you got the methodist episcopal these churches lobbying white churches lobbying you even had the ku klux klan have a church oh my goodness let me i got to go back to that the ku klux klan had a church in harford county you had the grand dragon the Kleagles, the titans the cyclopses and they were having a good old time imposing racially the theological regime of racial segregation that's 1924 i got to move past this because i ain't got the time but right here you got the uh when public housing was set up look at this map the darker the gray the more black people live in it in the census tract this is from 1940 you don't see public housing in whiter communities it was placed in communities where there were higher percentages of black people. So you had that, and then it's also placed around the waterfront, which was filthy. Nobody wanted to live near the water at that time because World War II, shipping, shipbuilding, pollution was at its all time high. You did not want to live near the water, and that is where public housing was placed. But there was also another form of segregation because the actual public housing communities themselves were also racially segregated. And then, of course, I know you all are familiar with this map right here, the most devastating spatial map in American history, created for over 200 cities across the country. And if you read Antero Patella's book, Not in My Neighborhood, he has a great chapter in there on how this map was really rooted in the pseudoscience of eugenics and determined access to capital for people living in different neighborhoods. And so Baltimore today is a category five hyper segregated city um just like a hurricane category five is the most intense most devastating form of racial segregation that we have and you can see what i call the white l blue dots representing white green dots representing black i call that the black butterfly red represents asian and then so and then orange represents hispanic latino latina Latinx population here in Baltimore. And we have a small Native American community in the Upper Fells Point area as well. So basically you have this white L, black butterfly, Asian archipelago and Latina Lagoon right here in Baltimore today, very hyper segregated city. And redlining as this uh, maps from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition is still going on. This is from 2011 to 2013. You got home business, or excuse me, home lending. The bigger the dot, the bigger the loans. Look at that, concentrated in the white L. Businesses for lending for small business, not quite as pronounced, but still the bigger dots are in and around that L. And so still going on. And then there's a Zillow analysis showing that for homes that are located in those historically four color coded communities, the, the homes that are in the red communities are still tremendously undervalued compared to the homes in blue, green, and yellow line communities. And this is 80 years later after the imposition of those maps in the 30s. So it's showing us the ongoing impact of the devastating residential security map. And so we gotta do a lot of things. We gotta make black neighborhoods matter we have to institute what I'm calling Baltimore neighborhood reparations. We had to stop redlining and that old subpriming. We have to do all these things to make our cities and make our communities whole. So I'm gonna stop right there and hand it off to the next speaker. Thank you so much for getting us off to such a good start. Our second speaker is Dr. Ashante Reese from the University of Texas, and she brings together expertise in food studies and black geographies. So her first book, which is called Black Food Geographies, Race, Self-Reliance and Food Access in Washington, D.C., examines anti-blackness and food access. Her second book, Black Food Matters, Racial Justice in the Wake of Food Justice is a collection that she co-edited with Hannah Garth, and that one explores food in Black life across the United States. So thanks so much for being with us. Welcome to the virtual podium. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to start my own timer just in case. Um, so I knew Dr. Brown was going to be talking for me and I knew Dr. Brown was going to come with like some really good historical perspectives. And so what I thought I would do today with my time is to really think just juxtapositionally um, around different forms of inequity, some food, others not, um, in terms of what I have observed um, across multiple cities over the last couple of years. But before that, um, so this book, A Map to the Door of No Return by Dion Brand is one of the books that I think with a lot. And I just want to read a little bit of an excerpt from this book in terms of how I think about um, the role of history and the past in shaping some of the inequities that we think about today. The door of no return, real and metaphoric as some places are, mythic to those of us scattered in the Americas today. To have one's belonging lodged in a metaphor is voluptuous intrigue. To inhabit a trope, to be a kind of fiction. To live in the Black diaspora is, I think, to live as a fiction, a creation of empires and also self-creation. It is to be a, living, a being living inside and then also outside herself. It is to apprehend the sign one makes yet to be unable to escape it except in radiant moments of ordinariness made like art. To be a fiction in search of its most resonant metaphor then is even more intriguing. So I, I am scouring maps of all kinds, the ways that some fictions do discursively, elliptically, trying to locate their own transform, transferred selves. So I like, um, I, like what, I like a lot of what Dion Brand does in this book, but what she does is help us to orient the ways that we think about history in the past, not as something distant, but as something that keeps replicating itself in different forms. Um, and I also draw a lot in my own work from Catherine McKittrick, who talks about plantation futures and past and the ways that plantation logics, regardless of what their formation is, they're, they're, um, it's not just a place, but a set of um, practices and logics that continue to replicate reproduce themselves. So I'd like to think about how this has shown up <clears throat> in the more recent present, actually. Last summer, <clears throat> at this time last year and last summer, I was still living in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was engaging in some of the protests and uprisings that were happening in the city right after the murder of George Floyd. So what was really striking to me about these uprisings on the, the photo on the right is a crowd at City Hall, uh, which I lived a block away from. But it's the photo on the left that I would like to call our attention to. So while these protests are happening and people are congregating in the street, and while people are congregating in the street, regardless of the kinds of risks that were associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, businesses were preparing to protect their property. On the left, you see a, a photo of Streets Market and Cafe is the local grocery store that I would walk to um, on a near weekly basis. And on one day during these um, these protests, I walked to the store to find that the windows were boarded up. But it wasn't even just the boarded up, boarding up of the windows that I was drawn to. I was drawn to this sign declaring that they are still open. And my question to myself as I watched the sign, looked at the sign, and also as I was considering whether or not I was going to still shop at the store, was open for and to whom and for what purposes. Right. So we've got this juxtaposition happening in the city um, of, as Dr. Brown has already outlined for us, of deep historical and contemporary racial inequities. And then we have the store that is um, a small store, really nice store, but also would be at a price point that um, many people in the city would not have chosen or been able to afford. Seeing this image also brought me back to 2015 when Freddie Gray was murdered in the same city. When uprisings started in the city, many businesses, including grocery stores, were closing down. And at the very same time, um, the what was not quite formed yet, but the Black Church Food Security Network were getting many, many calls from people to get food. And so I just want to read a little excerpt from an interview with Hebert Brown. He says, in January of 2015, and I had a meeting with farmers and public health professionals and pitched this idea of a Black church-led food sustainability project. And then six months later, after Freddie Gray was murdered in police custody, people started demonstrating and Baltimore was closed down. 
there were no stores, there was no, there was very little access. And our phone started rising, ringing as the church became, at the church because our calling card was food. People knew that the food, the church had food and the church had a garden. And that's where the Black Church Food Security Network um, was formed. So I was thinking about what it means for people to be in the streets protesting for Black lives, what it means for businesses to uh, shutter their doors and literally barricade their windows, and for organizations like the Black Food Church, the Black Church Food Security Network to be doing this work of providing a necessary good for the public. And then there's this more recent, I live in Austin now, and many of you have probably heard about the uh, winter storms that we just had in, about a month ago. And um, originally there were supposed to be rolling blackouts across the city and the part of town that I live in, East Austin was one of the first parts of the city to have a rolling blackout. East Austin is also one of the few parts of the city within the city limits where there you can still find pockets of black and brown, mostly Latinx communities um, that have been able to at least survive the um, intense gentrification here. But what was supposed to be a rolling blackout actually never rolled. So me, myself and people in my community uh, did not have electricity for several days. What you see here on the left is a video that I took while waiting in line for the grocery store. You can't hear me narrating that well, but I am standing in line. Where I'm standing in line, I was probably about the 250th or 30th, 300th person in this line trying to get into the grocery store in HEB. And when I finally got into the grocery store, this is what I and many others were greeted with. And I felt completely disheartened by the idea that um, the management of the store would allow us to come in when these, shell these shelves were that bare. And so this has had me thinking about the intersections of unnatural disaster, um, city planning and corporate dependency on supermarkets, which I write about in my first book. And then I just want to show one last thing for us to maybe think about, particularly as um, people who are experiencing one form of inequity are likely experiencing other forms of inequity. And here is an example of such. So this morning I'm checking the news and I'm reading about Mount Caramel apartments in East Austin. Again, this part where there are still these pockets of black and brown communities um, that have been deemed not habitable because they have these residents have been without um, gas um, for over a month. And then there was a leak that happened uh, within the last couple of days that now is forcing these, these residents to move temporarily to other places. So I wanted to juxtapose this, um, this apartment complex, one of the few places in East Austin that is still affordable for low-income families with this um, snapshot that I take from Zillow of this zip code 78702, where I live and where this apartment complex is and what the um, home value index says right now. So it is nearly impossible in the zip code to buy a house any less than half a million dollars, right? So I'm wondering like, as we are entering into conversation, Q&A and all these different things, um, one of the things that I've always wanted to do in my work is to not just think about food, right? Food is a lens that I use to think about other things, to think about spatial inequalities, to think about income, to think about housing, um, but also to think about black life and to think about organizing. I use the Black Church Food Security Network as an example, and to, I hope in the discussion to think about and talk more about mutual aid. So I will stop there, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, another really, really interesting talk. I can't wait for the conversation afterwards. Uh, but we've got two other speakers before that. And they are both speakers from within the Virginia Tech History Department. One of the really nice things about our webinar series is the opportunity to bring some outside speakers, some internal speakers together for these really rich conversations. And next up is Dr. Ladale Winling. He's an Associate Professor of History right here at Virginia Tech. He's author of the award-winning book, Building the Ivory Tower, Universities and Metropolitan Development in the 20th Century. And he's also co-creator of the website Mapping Inequality, 
redlining in New Deal America. And today he's going to draw on that project to discuss the origins, process, and consequences of redlining. Over to you, Dr. Winling. Thank you, Dr. Quigley. Thank you, Dr. Reese. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I want to talk about uh, redlining as kind of a basis for spatial inequality. As Dr. Brown mentioned, Baltimore was a pioneer in developing ways to separate the races, right? Through um, racial zoning, a segregation ordinance in 1910, as well as like a wide variety of, of other mechanisms to, to, to keep African-Americans um, away from the, the wealthiest neighborhoods, the best schools, and the um, top city amenities. And um, that local work in places like Baltimore, in places like Chicago, um, was the basis for a national effort and a series of programs that restructured real estate finance, home building, and city planning across the country for the rest of the 20th century. And so in some ways, we can think of um, redlining, talking about this historical process and the historical origins, as a way in which um, kind of individual um, racism and discrimination becomes systemic, basically how you turn private and individual practices um, into like a national system of public policy that becomes so regularized, that becomes so bureaucratic that um, it hardly seems like um, an individually hateful act at all. It's just the way that the system works. And this is especially um, um, rooted in home finance in city planning. So um, picking up the kind of story that uh, Dr. Brown introduced us to, um, in the 1930s, um, the Great Depression, there was a, a massive financial crisis as part of the, the national and global economic crisis. And um, it's estimated that a third to a half of all home, home mortgages across the country were in default. And so um, first the Hoover administration and then the Roosevelt administration um, stepped forward with public policy um, and new financial um, agencies and new financial regulations to try to solve this housing crisis and this financial crisis. And they created um, the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration. And um, I'll talk about how they created these kind of maps. This one I'm showing you here is of um, the north side of Chicago, but I'll come back to that in a second. Homeowners Loan Corporation was created to solve the, uh, to address the immediate crisis of the Great Depression. Um, and it ended up refinancing a million homes, about a fifth of all homes that were not farms um, in, uh, in the United States. And um, the Federal uh, Housing Administration was another agency which still exists today, which was created to um, kind of restructure home finance and the housing market across the country. And they did this in part by creating a long-term mortgage. If you want to become a homeowner, um, you're going to go to a bank or a mortgage company, a lender or something along these lines. And the odds are that you'll get a 30 year mortgage or something close to it. That was um, a development or an innovation of the 1930s. Uh, mortgages had been five years, seven years, and something along these lines. And so it was not accessible. It was very, um, um, it, it was uh, somewhat exclusive to get uh, a mortgage. And so when you have the federal government basically owning the mortgages to um, a million homes, um, and you have that money tied up for first 15 years and then 25 years and then becomes 30 years, there's a whole new exposure to risk. And this puts you know, some federal officials kind of into, into a panic. How do we know that when 
the FHA guarantees a mortgage or when um, the homeowners loan corporation um, refinances a mortgage that 15, 25, 30 years from now, the neighborhood is going to kind of um, be as good of an investment. And how do we know that there's um, like what sorts of changes and risks the investors will face? So the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, conducted uh, a survey of, of realtors, appraisers, um, people in cities throughout the country, as Dr. Brown mentioned, over 200 cities around the country um, and developed kind of a, a, a database of real estate information um, on a national level that had not existed up to that point. Um, and then um, from that kind of analog database, this um, information clearinghouse both the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration created a series of maps as well as a series of policies um, reshaping um, financial regulations and financial practices across, across the country. And I wanna highlight um, some of the um, details of this survey because as Dr. Brown mentioned, this was based upon prioritizing white home ownership and the values of homes in white neighborhoods. And it was um, uh, um, based on um, a kind of set of ideas of racial hierarchy about who were the worthy homeowners, who would take the best care of their homes as well as of their neighborhoods, and thus who was worthy of being invested in. And so um, this is the, the um, mapping system visually represents a series of um, categories of um, the green or best neighborhoods, the blue or desirable neighborhoods, um, the yellow C-rated um, declining neighborhoods, and the D or hazardous neighborhoods that were under threat or already rife with threat, um, like demographic transformation, as well as um, like poor environmental conditions and um, declining or stagnant like home values, right? These are all the kinds of risk, both economic as well as kind of social and demographic that the federal officials um, say make a neighborhood worthy of investing in. So you can see in this highlighted neighborhood, these are descriptions of this D, this redlined neighborhood here in Evanston, Illinois, right? Um, it says in part, this concentration of Negroes in Evanston is quite a serious problem for the town as they seem to be growing steadily and encroaching into adjoining neighborhoods. Um, and as a result, this extremely desirable suburb um, on Lake Michigan in um, in Metro Chicago, um, this neighborhood is, is redlined and they find over the course of the rest of the 20th century for, um, they find difficulty in getting um, home financing um, as well as civic investment. We cannot say that like this map causes urban deterioration, but it kind of it institutionalizes the ideas of these realtors, lenders, appraisers, um, and gives it the force of the federal government um, and their billions of um, billions of dollars of investment behind um, mortgage guarantees by the FHA. Right? So um, I point out in part um, this, this Evanston neighborhood for a reason that I'll come back to in, in a moment. But something that the Homeowners Loan Corporation and the FHA does is um, they change the standards for home appraisal, right? There's a series of economists who are actually based at Northwestern University in Evanston, along with um, economists at the University of Chicago on the south side of Chicago. Um, who kind of develop new theories about what value even is, and especially what real estate value is. And then they teach home appraisers and realtors what, the, um, what those practices are and how to, right, basically develop a 
what at the time is seen as a scientifically valid way of um, evaluating home value. And that, that uh, those processes and those practices of appraisal, in fact, continue forward because they seem so natural, they seem so um, bureaucratic, and they seem so um, uh, um, removed from processes of racial hatred, even though the people who develop these are the ones who are filling out these kinds of surveys, um, calling neighborhoods blighted, saying that um, the arrival of African Americans to northern cities in the Great Migration is a source of infiltration and endangerment. And so um, even in the present day, um, we can see that appraisals favor um, homes and home values in white neighborhoods, and they favor white homeowners, in part because of these kind of systemic um, issues of valuation that go into um, the process of evaluating the, the, um, the cost or the, the worth and value of a home. And those kinds of evaluations, which are widespread and bureaucratized and spatial in nature, because neighborhood is a key element in um, home value, um, has implications for availability of investments for um, school funding, for example, because school financing is often um, spatially and geographically based because of the local property taxes. Um, and so the reason that I um, point out um, this neighborhood in Evanston, to follow up another point from Dr. Brown, is that Evanston has actually passed the nation's first um, program for racial reparations. And in part, it's because they discovered and did a good deal of research about this process of redlining and the denial of capital and the um, kind of exploitative financial practices that meant that African-American home buyers or potential borrowers could not get access to mortgage or they couldn't get um, kind of standard conventional mortgages and had to do exploitative borrowing practice like contract buying or had to kind of remain as um, renters. And so that kind of process of defining um, neighborhood risk worthiness as well as home value as kind of like um, aftershocks and continuing resonances um, that uh, uh, reverberates across, across the country to the present. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got lots to talk about and one more talk to listen to. And I'm especially pleased to introduce our fourth and final speaker because she's a graduate student right here in the history department at Virginia Tech. Uh, she is C. Valencia Turner. She's currently a second year graduate student. And in addition to studying at Virginia Tech, she's also an oral history intern at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And in her research, she uses oral history to highlight the significance of education within the Black community, and also the erasure of Black teachers in public memory after desegregation. And today she's going to talk to us about busing and desegregation in Norfolk, Virginia. So thank you very much for being here, and over to you. Thanks. I just need one second to get set up and I'll be ready. Can you all see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, good. Um, sorry, I have two monitors. So I'm trying to get everything set up properly. Um, so my topic is kind of like a side quest from some of the research that I'm doing for my article requirement for my thesis.
Okay, unfortunately, it looks as though we have lost uh, Valencia Turner. Uh, what I'm going to suggest is that hopefully, fingers crossed, she'll be able to rejoin us momentarily. In the meantime, I think we should just go ahead and get started uh, answering uh, some questions. Uh, and of course, we've still got three panelists here, and hopefully Valencia Turner will be able to come back any minute now. Um, but let's go ahead and get started with a couple of questions. And this is a good time to remind everyone about that uh, lovely Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please uh, type your questions in. And again, if it's a comment or observation, that's fine as well. It's it's really, really nice for the speakers to see the response um, to what they've shared with us today. So we'll start with a question for Dr. Reese. Um, it's uh, from a person who is a big fan of your work, so already is well aware of what you're doing and wants to give a shout out to the local mutual aid group here in Blacksburg called the Future Economy Collective. And one of the things uh, this attendee is struck by in discussions of mutual aid is how it challenges stable notions of space. And so hearing you talk about your mutual aid group made this person think of how many resonances and shared experiences there are with mutual aid in Appalachia during the summer 2020 uprisings, including protect protection of property, even if that looks kind of different in rural versus urban spaces. So he really is interested in hearing you talk a bit more about mutual aid, how it interacts with perceptions of space. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for the question. And um, and and yeah, I appreciate the question a lot. So um, I'm going to give a shout out to one of my graduate students right now, Simone Johnson. She and I are writing a piece on um, mutual aid currently um, and, and mutual aid as a manifestation of Black ecologies um, in both Baltimore and Chicago. So look out for that. Maybe it'll be out next year. But one of the things that we were thinking about, or one of the things that we're trying to write through is thinking about mutual aid as a, as a spatial project. And I don't think it's necessary to think about something being a spatial project as being the same thing as being stable and fixed. And in fact, I think a lot about McKittrick's writing that um, challenges us to not think about space as just is or, or even stable on, on some level, right? But that space is something that is always in negotiation, always bound up in struggle, struggle, always being produced. And so when I think about mutual aid, I do think about it as a spatial project. I think about it as something that is transforming um, how people relate to each other, but also how we relate to, to where we are. Um, and I use, you know, I use this example of, um, use the Black Church Food Security Network as an example, but I'm also thinking about how um, transforming space doesn't necessarily mean just transforming a physical landscape. And I'm thinking about how with the mutual aid efforts that we were doing here in Texas, we were using a lot of virtual networks, right? And so I literally transformed my, my Twitter timeline as a space that I usually am like talking about my own work or you know talking about random stuff as a space to connect and as a space to organize. And I think that is something that is really, really important. The last thing I wanna say about mutual aid and perhaps um, that's speaking to this kind of um, uh, challenging um, stable notions of space is that mutual aid's outcomes aren't about creating something that can be forever necessarily. I think mutual aid has necessarily been about being flexible, um, being creative and, and um, meeting people's, because you're trying to meet people's needs and meeting those needs means that you have to be dynamic and what that looks like. And so like an example that I'll give is uh, the garden you probably read about in my book that I loved and I, I spent a lot of time there I was thinking about doesn't exist anymore. Right. And if we think about that garden as a form of mutual aid and a form of care, um, I think we, we, we should be careful to not think about the fact that just because it doesn't exist that made it a failure. I think mutual aid makes us think about transformations of space as sets of experiments, um, regardless of how long those transformations live. Thank you for the question. Great, and thank you very much for the answer too. Um, so it looks as though Valencia Turner is back with us. Thank you uh, for rejoining and sorry about your uh, computer woes there. Hopefully uh, it won't happen again. So I'm gonna turn things back over to you and feel free, take a minute to get set up. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing what you say. Thanks, um, hopefully my laptop doesn't act up again. <laughs> 
So can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, thank you. So um, like I was saying before, that my research is based on Black teachers and desegregation. And this was kind of a side quest. Um, it was information I found during my research. It was really interesting, but it wasn't really relevant to my research, so I couldn't use it. Um, so in Norfolk, no real resolution for de desegregation began until busing began several years later. Although faculty and student desegregation have begun, the process was slow and tedious. Because Norfolk was so racially segregated by neighborhood and school, busing became a key component of integration in Norfolk. The initial freedom of the choice plan provided by Norfolk Public Schools provided no free transport to students who chose to integrate, meaning that Black students had to either walk long distances or rely on their working parents for transport. As a result, Black students stayed at their Black schools close to home, even though Norfolk was desegregated. So Virginia's politicians coined, created and coined the policies that led to four school closings. Norfolk was one of the last cities to integrate, fighting integration to the very last second with qualification tests and court cases to prevent the Norfolk 17 from integrating. Even after desegregation, white citizens of Norfolk fought desegregation through opposing district busing, and establishing several private white schools such as Tidewater Academy. Norfolk was an urban southern hotspot for massive resistance and desegregation and can be viewed as a microcosm of the social tensions that flare throughout the South. Even though Norfolk's Black population and schools were comparatively smaller than other urban centers of the South, the bitter fight against desegregation waged by the Norfolk City Council and white Norfolkians was reminiscent of a larger movement for massive resistance happening in the South. Black Norfolkians countered massive resistance with multiple lawsuits, reminiscent of Brown, that worked their way through the Virginia Supreme Court system with mixed success. This fight between Black and white Norfolkians through the city council, the school board, and the Supreme Court serves as a legal and social representation of what, uh, for what rural and urban areas of the South are experiencing simultaneously. So I use interest convergence theory to kind of ground my research in the way that I understand and read through the archives. Interest convergence theory is by Derek Bell, it's kind of like the core of critical race theory. And he basically states that the needs of um, Black people and racial equality will only be accommodated when it converges with the interests of white. So any type of like justice, remedy, equality, um, or racial equality for Black people is never sought and only um, happens when the superior societal status of middle and upper class whites are not threatened. School, let's see. School choice was an intentional um, way for school administrators to visibly comply with desegregation in the aftermath of Brown. Brown II and various state court cases without doing any effective legal groundwork. In 1968, 28 of the 57 schools remained segregated and at the elementary level, schools were 90% segregated and it increased with each level. Busing became a key, key part of the no local NAACP's chapter stride towards integration. Busing ultimately revealed class and racial strife within Norfolk as busing showed the death of Norfolk segregation and class strife between the working class blacks and middle class black and white parents. What followed next was a legal tug of war between middle class black people and, double, and the NAACP between middle class white people, the school board, and the city government. On March 18, 1969, city attorney Leonard Davis noted that he and his lawyers from the Justice Department and the NAACP had met in five lengthy conferences but had been unable to agree on a practical program for integration. The final resolution ignored every single issue that black constituents had raised in court, the Justice Department and the NAACP. It left freedom of choice enrollments in place and it retained faculty integration goal of two minority teachers per school, virtual representation. The other requirements, including busing and a rapid change in student population were completely ignored. Soli was an advocate and a, um, and a policy maker and advocate created to develop a plan for Norfolk's integration. His plan called for a dramatic revision of elementary school assignments with pairing of many schools in racially identified neighborhoods, meaning that a child attending a predominantly white school, we match with the child attending a black, predominantly black school such as Liberty Park, and they would switch places. In this proposal, the students in both schools would be placed in a single attendance zone with the children in grades one through three going to Ingleside, and those four through six attending Liberty Park. With this system, he had hoped to er eradicate the racial identity of the city and the elementary schools. Furthermore, his proposal called for substantial integration at nine of the city's 11 junior high schools and all the city's senior high schools. To achieve these results, Stoli suggested new zoning and crosstown busing for desegregation. So this photo shows kind of like um, Stoli's plan in the middle of integration. And you can see there's like in some of the schools, there's like massive gaps, particularly in white neighborhoods, 
between the percentage of white and black students like Willoughby, Ocean View, and Young Park. And then down here we have Calcott, Crossroads, and then my elementary school when I was a kid, Oakwood. So white outrage to solely plan was immediate when it hit the newspapers. White parents wrote in letters like this one mentioned here and that letter to the editor threatening to pull themselves from the city and the school district. The Stoli plan presented, according to them, a hazard to the health and safety of their children and threatened the stability of their community. White parents and community members argued that integration was not the issue, but their community safety was. As Ingleside parents allowed for the government to bust their children from the neighborhood, then these common goals and commonly recognized symbols of their community, aka whiteness, would fade away. White parents feared an aggressive integration plan that would rapidly eradicate Norfolk's highly segregated social and community structure that kept their neighborhoods wealthy, white, and secluded. The presence of busing and intermixing with lower class black children would destroy their community values as well as those that instilled in their children. White flight and suburbanization became a weapon that white parents would wield over city council and the school board, threatening to deliver financial blows to the city by taking their wealth out of their neighborhoods. On May 19th, Hoffman issued his opinion approving the school board's interim desegregation plan for the 1969 to 1970 school year. It called for a continuation of the freedom of choice assignment plan at the elementary and junior high school levels and the adoption of a geographic zoning program for senior high schools. But the opinion say that there is no need for crosstown busing or racial balancing, the core issue of the original court case, instead suggested time and patience for every party involved. The final plan rejected desegregation and economic inequality as a whole, and instead they emphasized the need for a stable, effective education program, which would, eat, which would offer each child at least a certain number of years or time in a hopefully or optimally desegregated school. And this practice translated into a system of neighborhood elementary schools that would participate in a feeder system with regional, junior, and senior high schools. The objective at every level was to provide the best educational quality for students of both races, by creating schools with a predominantly middle-class background. At this time, the administrators believe that there is a high citizen school correlation that linked whites to middle-class opportunity and economic success and blacks to poverty. When viewed in light of the district's goal, the socioeconomic analysis lended a profound result, which is that in order to achieve and maintain the benefits of desegregation, the district's leaders argue that the schools must have a clear majority of white children in order to keep the school successful. Administrators began to integrate, just enough to legally comply, but centering the middle-class white values of schools, which are closely linked with success, adding just enough black students to get by. This time, the narrowly um, this time it was narrowly tailored to disadvantage black working class students who were considered unsuccessful in the eyes of the school board and city council. This plan left half the city's elementary schools and junior high schools segregated and had no plan for racial balancing at Booker T. Washington High School, the majority of black working class school or the city's other schools. While the two racial minority allotment was a victory for black teachers, this became a way for white administrators to integrate without putting any black students in their white middle class um, classrooms. The Norfolk desegregation case returned to court yet again in October in 1969. The Court of Appeals returned, overturned the original judge Hoffman's decision and found that in short, Norfolk was not doing enough to create a unitary system as required by federal law. And it said it effectively excluded many of the black peoples from integrated schools on account of their race, a result of which is the um, antithesis of a racial unitary system. The Fourth Circuit Co Court sent the case back to Judge Hoffman and gave specific instructions requiring that the school board submit a new desegregation plan by July 27. Most importantly, the court ruled that the city must provide transportation to students to integrate. In the final order, 50 elementary schools were placed into five groupings of three schools each. Each grouping included one black and two white schools with all students in grades one through four assigned to the former white school and all students in grades five and six assigned to the former black school. I think this was the most interesting photo from um, the collection I went through where it's black parents who are um, actually protesting school um, segregation. And so while middle class parents and the NAACP celebrate their legal victory, the brunt of busing fell on the children of black working class parents. Students had to pay $5 a month to buy a ticket from the bus line, which created a significant financial drain on working class families with multiple children. Black parents were forced to withdraw their students from school 
put them in private schooling or simply neglect their school because they could not afford the weekly busing fee for their large families. White administrators shifted the, um, these, the brunt of desegregation on the backs of working class black families who found themselves at odds with middle class black parents. On the other hand, white middle class um, parents refused to use racial slurs and insults in their attacks on busing, since many called for a colorblind forgetfulness of, seg of segregation as the only way to move forward. As a result, white middle class parents began to use dog whistle words to suggest the epithets from segregation giving birth to citizens councils, nice white parents, and many of the racial dog whistles used by white conservatives and moderates in the media today. Instead of focusing on race explicitly, their letters focus on government intervention, protecting their communities, and the idea of a high quality education. White working pa class parents who could not afford to send their children to segregationist academies like Norfolk Academy, had their children as sometimes unwilling drivers of immigration. So this letter is from the Norfolk Desegregation Archives, and there's a lot of them that come from like white parents writing to school board members, writing to judges, writing to city council members and lawyers, etc. And most of them kind of have the same type of language. So this is from the Norfolk Tea Party to the school um, to, to the school board. And they say things like, um, there's a there's no educational reason to bus our children. I can only guess at the increasingly deteriorating efforts on a child's development between first and sixth grades caused by no growth periods of bus rides and then emphasizes the need for a good education. And then here's a photo of them protesting in 1971 in Norfolk that made it all the way to the New York Times. So this is short, but this was the birth and beginning of the movement to bus in Norfolk. It's a small section of a further research that I've done that extends into a much larger story. In many ways, the busing apology was a success as much as it was a failure. For a brief amount of time, Norfolk schools were racially integrated due to busing. However, in the late, late 1980s to 1990s, as government austerity, conservatism, and opposition to government intervention became, became, began to become politically popular, Derek Bell's, inter, um, um, inver, Derek Bell's um, convergence, interest convergence theory became true, and the busing program was killed. Desegregation scholars called the aftermath of this resegregation. As long as it took to desegregate, Norfolk's quickly snapped back into segregated schools, neighborhoods, and classes as soon as the busing program stopped, and it continues to this day. Thank you very much. I'm really, really glad you persevered and uh, that your computer decided to cooperate the second time around. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, so we ha have some questions coming in which I'm really glad to see. Uh, feel free to keep typing them in the Q&A box. Uh, we're eager to hear what you think and get your input on these important topics. Um, the panelists have begun uh, answering some of the questions uh, in the Q&A box itself. So some of you can see that, but not everyone, uh, especially those who are viewing on Facebook, um, but also people who are viewing Zoom via phone uh, may not be able to see the Q&A box. So what I'm going to do is, at, at, at the risk of kind of uh, asking a lot of the panelists, is uh, ask them to kind of summarize some of those text responses that they have already typed in. And and one question that I'd really like to hear the response to live concerns uh, black high and middle schools in the public school system. So the question which came in from a Facebook viewer is why is it appropriate for HBCUs to exist, but not for black high and middle schools in the public school system to be identified in that way, I think is what the viewer is asking. And Dr. Brown has uh, typed in a, a really uh, good answer already maybe maybe I can ask you invite you to summarize that Dr. Brown and then see if anyone else wants to weigh in as well sure I mean I'll just repeat what the jazz singer Nina Simone said which is desegregation is a joke and sister C Valencia Turner has laid it out America is resegregating you have white breakaway school districts that are forming with wealthy white enclaves so in fact majority black high schools and middle schools still do exist because desegregation was never effectuated in a real way. What her presentation, uh, the soon to be Dr. Turner's presentation showed is that white desegregation resistance was in fact the order of the day. Um, and therefore, that's why I think HBCUs and resegregating 
uh, K through 12 schools absolutely still do exist because really the basis of uh, school attendance is where you live. And so as long as residential segregation is still a reality, then you're not going to get around uh, having schools that are segregated as well. Great, thank you. Any, anyone else want to weigh in on that question? Okay, uh, so another question is for Dr. Reese. Uh, one viewer is interested in the book you quoted from at the beginning of your talk, and I'm really interested in that as well. So I guess we wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the book and the scholar and uh, why it's so important to you. Yeah, absolutely. And Paul, I hope we can go back to the question about reparations too, um, because I, I Yes, I would like to talk about that. Um, but the book that I quoted from is A Map to the Door of No Return by Dion Brand. Um, and I cannot remember when I first picked up this book. I wish I could like show you all um, my notations from the various readings of it. But what this book does for me is one, it makes me think about what is possible when we take these conversations about redlining, et cetera, et cetera and put them in the longer durée toward emancipation that started with the door no return and thinking about enslavement as an origin point for thinking about some of the stuff that we um, frame as anti-Blackness as an origin point, perhaps not a single origin point. And so Dion Brand writes this long meditation through the idea that the door of no return and the transatlantic slave trade um, colors or influences things like identity, memory, history, belonging. Um, and one of the things that she talks about that I think is relevant for the kinds of work that we're discussing today is that Black bodies, like Black people's bodies and Black neighborhoods and what's, um, what is produced and consumed in Black neighborhoods become seen as public property. And I've thought about this quite a lot in these discussions around what does it mean to Obviously, I think about food, but what, is, what does food justice mean? What does housing justice mean? Um, and how sometimes the ideas and the creativity of Black artists and Black activists gets conscripted into this very liberal um, kind of framework. This is partly why I want to talk about the reparations that loses the radical nature of what was actually produced. And I think Dion Brand's works helped me think about that. But it also, there's no way to read Dion Brand without thinking diasporically and thinking beyond the US as well. And so I was just thinking about um, part of why I wanted to read an excerpt from that book is I wonder what happens when we take our very US centric conversation that we're having here and thinking about it in a broader diasporic lens. Great, thank you very much. Um, so reparations, I, I'm sure you're not the only one who, who would like to talk about that topic. And we had a question come in, um, which we've already begun to answer uh, in text, but the question was about the Evanston reparations program that was mentioned. So who led the effort? And secondly, does this Evanston example serve as a model for other cities like Baltimore, like Austin, but presumably lots of other cities we could think about as well. So anyone feel free to dive into that question. I'll just lay out the, um, the, the, the basic um, summary. There was uh, an African-American city council member who had um, worked to develop or could have to, uh, saw the opportunity for um, using um, kind of licensing revenue from the recent statewide legalization of marijuana to devote those new revenues to like investment within um, the community for racial justice reparative programs. Um, and Basically, there was a partnership with a local historian who kind of wrote about some of these forms of exploitation and extraction over the course of the 20th century, made the community case, and then helped build support within the city council for, for that program. It was kind of authorized about 15 months ago, and then it was just like this week that the um, like final um, details of the program were passed within the city.
Thank you. Um, well, I guess I'll, I will jump in. Um, I think, well, I think a lot of things. I think what I am willing to share, like what, what, what comes to mind right now is that um, one of my hesitations about calling this reparations is really that it still belies this like um, uh, reliance on private property but private property that someone already owns, not it's not a redistributive kind of thing, right? It's not it's not shifting um, the, any kinds of um, power dynamics there in, in some ways. And I think Dr. Brown says this in his response that it also is targeting people who already own a home that does not include renters, but you know it may be a first step. I also wonder, um, I think something can be good and still not be called reparations, right? I think this can be a good thing and we don't have to call it reparations. And I'm thinking here about Catherine Frank's work in her latest book, Repair. And one of the things that I think she does so beautifully is go back to um, thinking about early abolition, not like necessarily just contemporary abolition, but early abolitionist movements. And she talks about the unfinished project, project of emancipation. And I think that phrase, really strikes me in this conversation about reparations, because if we think about reparations as a part of this unfinished product project, does it change what we think is possible? And does it change what we think the outcome should be? I think for me, it does, right? To kind of connect these present things with this long durée. Um, and then I just wanted to offer a suggestion for readings for people who are thinking about reparations and property. In addition to Catherine Frank's book, Repair, um, Ronaldo Walcott has a new book called On Property. And I think it's a really interesting thing to think about in terms of uh, reparations, particularly um, for Black people who were once considered property. What does it mean for reparations to then mean that we then own something as a form of property? Um, so so yeah, so I think my, my thoughts is it, it, it's good. I don't quite understand why we call it reparations, but I think it's a it, it could be a good step. Great, thank you. I think I'll respond by uh, extending on Dr. Reese's point and, and really highlighting the fact that, you know, in order to, you know, complete the project of emancipation, um, you know, I think the field of history actually has a powerful role to play. Historians have a par powerful role to play because there has to be a reckoning. There has to be an accounting of what happened. And if you tell me, look, okay, we got these 10 things have happened, but we're gonna call reparations for this one piece, complete reparations, then no, that's not real. You know, you actually have to say, all right, if there are 10 things, then there has to be healing, restorative efforts made in all 10 areas. So when you still have what Dr. Reese's work, food apartheid, transit apartheid, you know, educational apartheid, when you still have, you know, the racial wealth gap, which I, you know, really, we, we really should be calling the racist wealth gap. When you still have these things going on in American society, you know, police violence, uh, all the things that we've seen over the past five or so years, you know, when you still have that going on, then the full process of reparations requires a reckoning. And that, that's the one thing that I think America is loathe to really engage in. We don't like to look our history in the mirror and that's where historians come into play. Can historians then step up to the plate and offer these localized histories that are complete across domains and then actually in some, maybe in some ways actually propose, you know, put some sort of monetary figure. What was the, what was the cost of transit apartheid? What is the cost? You know, we got big data and little data and all kinds of data. So we should be able to quantify on some level or another, you know, how much each of these system, systemic forms of damage and harm have cost. And then that's the thing that you repay. And the other thing with this plan that strikes me and I think one of the Evanston City Council members as wrong is to actually prescribe how black people should use that money like reparations like any any form of judicial compensation is should, should be about here's compensation nobody says to a crime victim all right here's a, you get a five million dollar settlement but you got to spend it this way you can only spend it over at target uh on the east side of town 
after 5 p.m. Like, no, compensation is here's what you deserve based on the pain we inflicted. Now, how you spend it, that's up to you. So if it's not with that sort of impetus embedded in it. Now, I'm not saying that some forms of spending couldn't be prescribed, but I do think that overall, if this, if you're like Dr. Reese said, if you're going to call this reparations, where it is highly prescriptive in terms of and restrictive in terms of how black people can use these funds, then I, you know, this is problematic. But it can still be a good thing, as Dr. Reese said, it's just not complete. Thank you. And anyone else want to uh, weigh in there? Well, we, we have a question for Valencia Turner about the integration of schools and the impact on teachers as well as students. Do you have anything you want to share from your research about the impact on teachers? Yeah, definitely. That's what my, my main research focuses on. Um, in terms of integration of teachers, what you see is a lot of mass firings around the time of integration. So you have a couple of people who trickle in as sort of like um, virtual representation for boards that claim they're doing enough to integrate. But the most of the time it's teachers are getting laid off. They're, get, they're given a lot of um, tests to test their knowledge because um, tests, they're given a lot of like different red, um, different barriers to their employment, whether it's the fact that their job is now across the city, um, the staff doesn't support them in any way, the students don't respect them. And then it's just kind of like this massive filtering out of black teachers and an exodus from the system in totality. One of the um, hardest things that I had to do, because originally my city that I was going to study was going to be my hometown, Norfolk. And then I had to change to Richmond because there just wasn't any black teachers around that really survived desegregation that I could find in an interview. And the ones that did survive it had passed ultimately. So um, a lot of the, there's a lot of more like contemporary articles that talk about teacher trends, race statistics and population. And they can all like talk about the lack of black teachers now that traces back to desegregation and this mass exodus and firing of black educators. Great, thank you. Can I speak to that really quickly? Yep, sure. uh, There's this article, Dr. soon to be Dr. Turner might want if she doesn't have it already, you know, from 1970, and it shows how black teachers uh, across the South, they were displaced. It said hundreds of them have been demoted, dis dismissed outright, denied new contracts, or pressured into resigning. And so they were approaching the Nixon administration after these, you know, wholesale firings and demotions of black teachers. And so they're actually <laughs> were calling for uh, a reparative plan for black teachers. Uh, and so, you know, this speaks to her point precisely, but it was covered in the media at that time. And this is why I say desegregation was controlled, controlled desegregation, not real desegregation. Real desegregation has never happened, which is why we still have an apartheid society today. Thank you. Um, another follow-up question. Uh, the first one I think we answered, which was about black middle and high schools. And uh, the question is kind of following up to ask, would it be beneficial to attach a kind of historically black label to, to middle and high schools that are historically black in the same way as HBCUs are classified? Would a more formal classification allow for better allocation of resources, for example, to achieve parity? Or would it run the risk of attaching a kind of stigma to those schools in the eyes of some people? Yeah, I know Dr. Brown probably has some thoughts on this. Um, and I, I think both of us having worked at HBCUs, if attaching a historically black to the title of a college meant more resources, then a lot of HBCUs would be a lot better off. Um, so that's the first thing I want to say. Attaching a label doesn't necessarily translate into parity or, or the kinds of resources that these institutions need and deserve. Um, the second thing is, I think it depends on where you are. I lived in Atlanta and many of the high schools are framed as historically Black schools, right? And, and take a lot of pride in that. And that pride exists beyond... Um, measures of academic success, right? Like the, they, there's, there's something really special for a lot of residents in Atlanta who can talk about going to specific high schools and that their, your, their parents went there, their grandparents went there, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, I mean, I don't know that it changes anything. I think we might think about what it means, what labels do and what naming does. I also think that, you know, on the on the other side of that, I was thinking about, um, I think I was just having a conversation about this earlier that like naming can be um, empowering, but name naming can also be a tactic of settler colonialism also, right? So I think we have to be just very clear about what the naming does and what it mobilizes. And I think if we're going to change names or if we're looking at reclassifying something, maybe we should redefine desegregation. Um, I don't think desegregation has to mean black and white people living next to each other or going to the same schools. Black people don't have to be near white people to be successful. Black people can be successful in their own institutions, in their own homes, uh, in their own neighborhoods. So that's not the issue. Um, the issue is once you segregate people by race, now you can economically weaponize uh, platforms like banks and even city budgets so that you have redlining, so that you have subpriming in black neighborhoods. So really what, what we need to do is desegregate resources, desegregate budgets. And if we did that and we actually allocated the restorative amounts that are needed in black neighborhoods, black schools, black redline, black neighborhoods, then those entities could thrive in on their own accord. The reason they aren't thriving now is the lack of resources. So I think that's the thing. If we say these let's desegregate that budget, go look at your city budget, go look at the state and national budget. We got segregated budgets. So let's desegregate that so that we have an equitable restorative allocation of resources to our black schools. And I think if we frame deseg and I'm drawing from uh, Sonia Douglas Horsford in her book, Learning in a Burning House, where she talks about that uh, very clearly. And she mentions the interest convergence theory, but also she, she sort of takes that riff and says that maybe the desegregation that was needed was not necessarily mixing of bodies, but an equitable distribution of resources. So that's another good text. Uh, I think a really good text to look at for this question. Excellent, and I'm sure the audience members appreciate the reading suggestions uh, throughout the event. That's always really helpful to come away from an event like this with new things to read and, and new things to explore. Um, well, I'm afraid to say we're actually out of time already. It went by very quickly, uh, but I wanna express my appreciation to the audience members for coming along and spending some time with us today. Thanks very much for feeding us those great questions uh, and driving the conversation at the end. The talk were wonderful. The conversation was wonderful too. Um, I also want to thank um, my colleagues in the history department at Virginia Tech who kind of worked together to put this event on, especially Dr. Anna Zeda, who really spearheaded the effort. And most of all, of course, I want to thank all four panelists for giving us such great material to think about and to learn from. We really appreciate it very much. And finally, I want to say I hope we see you at our next event, which is April 15th. That's the event on native resistance to settler violence. We've also got the um, Second Amendment talk, which is tomorrow. There was a little confusion about the date before, but that's tomorrow, and the link was pasted in the chat for that. And again, April 15th is the next in this series on native resistance to settler violence. So thanks very much to everybody, and have a good day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone.